Yeah, I'm, I'm John Gill. Um, the last sort of 20 years I've been working, well, about 20 years ago, I, I went to work in Bermuda at a reinsurance company. Um, and um, let, me, let me just have a show of hands. Is it, have we got any people from the finance industry here? We got a, oh, we've got a few. Okay. Insurance? Oh, dear. Okay. So the insurance people kind of know what that industry is like. Uh, reinsurance is, is, is like, uh, we're in England, so you go down the bookkeepers and you put a bet on, on a horse and, and a small bookkeeper, they'll get worried if there's a lot of bets on the one horse, they won't be able to pay everybody, they, they lay off the bet. Insurers do the same thing. If they've got, you, if you're a Florida insurer, you've in, insured a lot of homes there, you get worried if there's gonna be a hurricane, we're not gonna be able to pay. So I, I, uh, I had a previous career with the British government, I won't talk about that, but in 97, I was actually trying to get to Canada. I saw this job, it said supercomputing in Bermuda. I said, I'm in. So anyway, uh, this talk, I was asked to give it, I was down in, in the Caribbean at a Python conference. They said, can you give a talk in PyData? I said, great, I'll do it. So I came up with the title, it was originally Cat Modeling with Snakes, and, and I wanted my wife to help me with it, and, and she doesn't do snakes, so we had to change it to Python because she has this morbid fear of snakes. Uh, so the next question I got when I sent the, the, the talk title off, they said, cat, cat modeling, so a, a cat's catastrophes? And I said, yes. But, so this is my cat, Snowy, which is also a bit of a catastrophe in the, in the, uh, in the laundry. That there was the morning after Hurricane Fay, which hit Bermuda in 2014. We actually had two hurricanes hit the island inside a week. And it was, it was a crazy time on the island. I didn't have electricity for a month. Uh, I spent all my time working down the pub because they did have electricity. It was quite convenient, actually. Um, so, uh, a brief, what I'm going to talk about today, if you've come here to see code uh, and learn a, exactly how to model cats in with Python, you're probably going to be a bit disappointed. I apologize. If you want to talk about that in more detail after, I'd love to. Uh, I'm going to give you a brief history of sort of how the industry got where it is today and, and my own sort of career there. I turned up in Bermuda at this insurer and, and they were doing, I thought it was going to be these really sophisticated simulations of detailed hurricane models and, and, and really it was just multiplying numbers together and, and they were really mostly just trying to work out, they'd get insurers coming to them and they'd say that we've got all these policies, this is the business we've written and they were trying to work out really what, what the loss distribution was likely to be from this company and figure out how much to charge them for the cover they wanted. So there's going to be some Perl and Python. Uh, they're, they're the nearest thing I could find to the pearly gates at a park in Bermuda. This thing on the bottom is, is a, if you come to Bermuda and, and they're trying to persuade me to organise a Pi Data in Bermuda and you're all welcome, it'd be fantastic. There's pink sands and sunshine and it, it might be in February, so it might not be the best weather, but it would be better than the weather here. Uh, you, what you're supposed to do with these, these moon gates, they're all over Bermuda. You make a wish as you go through it. Well, I, I, for a while I used a language called TCL. Has anyone heard of TCL? And TK, you, to, it was great. To run your program, you type wish. And that's what I do every time I run my code. You kind of wish that it's going to run. So there's a bit of history in maths, not too much history. There will be more cats. Snowy has given me his release notes for the day. He says I can use his pictures. Uh, this is him writing code. He's not very good. Um, and this is actually just where I live. And that's sweeping up after the second hurricane that hit us in a week. Uh, the slide above was actually kind of cool. We had a pie day at, uh, at one of the schools in Bermuda. And Chapano, he, he, he does a robotics course. And he decorated it up with all pie symbols and we got the kids in. Uh, there's quite a lot of community things going on in Bermuda and uh, it's just, it, it, it's, it's a tiny island and everybody, it, it, it's, it's the weirdest thing. There's lots of people doing separate initiatives and most of us don't know about each other even though it's only 25 square miles. So the talk's gonna be old school. Now old school here, this, this chap, he's a DJ in Bermuda, fantastic guy. 
He's an old school DJ, he plays old music and he, he's so old school that he does his music off round things, the CDs. Now I remember when CDs were the coolest thing on the planet. If you had a CD player and you were playing your music with these things, you could dance without the needle scratching your records. Fantastic things. And these, these two guys are fantastic too. They, they, they do jazz and they're just wonderful. So I turned up in Bermuda in 1997 and, and I said, well, I said, where's the supercomputer? He said, well, it's this SGI Challenger. So it had 256 megabytes of memory. You measured its speed in megaflops and we had a grand total of three gigabytes of disk. That was for everything. Actually, they had a second machine that we used as backups, but that was a little bit different and they didn't like me using that one. Nowadays, you can buy a Raspberry Pi, there's one here, $35. Oh, and this SDI Challenger cost about $100,000 back in the day. Raspberry Pi, you get a gigabyte of memory, it's measured in gigaflops, and, it, and the, ten, you know, the $20 SD card is, has 32 gigabytes of storage, and it's much faster than the three gigabyte of disk we had. Um, and I, I guess the other point is actually in a real supercomputer back in that day, or in the 80s, if you bought a, a Cray XMP, it cost you tens of millions of dollars. You need a room this size to have it in, a massive power supply. That Raspberry Pi is as powerful as a Cray XMP was. So the message here is today, compute power has become essentially free. I mean, this thing runs on a, a phone charger. It's magic. So I turned up, I was the pesky consultant at this fancy reinsurance company, so they wouldn't let me use the SGI Challengers. They had fantastic terminals, it was space age, it was wonderful, but I, was, I, 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 I wasn't allowed that. So I managed to get a laptop and managed to install, the SGIs were running Unix, so I needed something that I could do Unix-like coding on, and there was this newfangled thing called Red Hat Linux. Uh, and, and I had a friend who managed to get it onto a laptop to me. It was fantastic. Uh, this had an incredible 64 megabytes of memory and I think it was an Intel Pentium and it had a one gigabyte disk and I, I started writing C++ code and uh, th there was somebody who used to work with me who will, I, I, keep, I keep bumming into people from this former company and I have to apologize for my C++ code because uh, they're still using it, it's a little bit sad. Fast forward a couple of years, the SGI machine had a disk failure. So we got the backup tape out and the backup tape did what backup tapes do, it didn't read. Um, and, it, you know, they came to me and they said, well, can we, uh, can we, um, by the way, the pictures may not make any reference. They, so, long story short, the SGIs were costing us about $30,000 a year just for the support contracts. Dell had just announced you could get a, a high-end server with Red Hat 5.1 on it, and it had a 36 gigabyte disk, 512 meg of RAM, and this Xeon CPU, and I was like, well, let's get one of those. Oh, and, the, and, and my boss wanted me to port the code to Windows, and I didn't want to do that, because I, I don't do Windows. So I, um, I said, well, let's get one of these Intel boxes and we'll first see if our code runs on Intel. I said, okay, well, so they, the first box that they bought at this company in 1999, um, they bought one of these, I called it Galois because I named all my computers after mathematicians. And um, long story short, we ported the code. There was a bit of a problem with SGIs and... Um, and Intel boxes had a different uh, difference of opinion and about which way around you should store bytes in floating point numbers. And I had to fix a bunch of files, but started to work. Turned out the code ran twice as fast on this, this SGI box that only cost $5,000 now instead of a, and sorry, on this Intel box, it, instead of $100,000. And, and we're only four or five years later. Uh, it's running twice as fast. My boss forgot about the Windows thing. We bought some more of these and we did all our production on that. Life was good. Fast forward, actually it was only about six months later, one of the bosses came to me and he said um, he wanted me to build a system and I had to call it Compass. Well, there was a reason I had to call it Compass. Was he'd, in his objectives for the year he'd said that he was going to create a system called compass so he, 
he came to me and says, I don't care what it does, but are you going to call it Compass? So I said, oh, fine. And, and what it was, it was a system for aggregating portfolios of contracts. And it was a great place to work because they, they gave me a lot of freedom there. Uh, I don't know why. They must have been mad. Um, but I come up with good stuff from there. So I used to, um, so I went with T, I decided in my wisdom, I was going to write this thing in TCL, tool control language it is. It was created at Sun. And it was a bit like Perl, a bit like Python. Um, and, and the thing that was great about it, it would run on Linux and Windows and then pretty much any machine you could, could get. This, this on the left actually is Guido, uh, and, and it came with a, a GUI toolkit called TK that I think had started life with, but in the Perl land. That on the left is a clock that Guido actually wrote, so Guido, uh, the Python man. Um, wrote as in TK, he used to have a clock like this on his kitchen wall with rotating discs. Um, the trouble with TK and TK Tickle, it took so long to start up that you had to put a flash screen up when you started your application. So I used to display the compass from the top of the city hall in Bermuda. Nobody who used this application, and they all lived in Bermuda, ever realized what it was. And I had a competition one time. There was free beer if you got it right. Nobody could do it. Anyway. Goes on a couple of years, I realized that Tickle was actually not the best computer language in the world. It, it, it was very quick to lash things together and, 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 and bolt together your shell scripts, but um, didn't really have any data structures to speak of. It had these sort of dictionary-like things, but they were painful to use. Kept hearing about this thing called Python, and because I'd be using Linux um, tools all the time and people would say, oh, you should script it with Python. So uh, one, one Christmas I got a book and I read about Python and, I, and they sold me at the white space thing. I thought, I don't have to type curly braces, I'm in. So anyway, we, had, we, we needed to replace Compass. It was creaking under its, its weight. And uh, so a friend of mine he, who worked on the project, I don't know whether, is Richard here? He is. I think it was your idea to call it GPS as better Compass. So that's what we called it. And it was actually one of the few times I've worked on a, a software project where they decide to do the second generation of something and it actually worked. I don't know whether any of you have been involved in any projects like that. If anyone ever says, we need to replace this with a new generation thing, run. It, it's not going to work. So you're working in reinsurance. It's what I call event-driven development. What happens is everything's going great. You think you're going to be working on something for the next month, and then a hurricane comes along and plans change. Suddenly, the most important thing is improving our hurricane models, because we just found out they weren't very good. Um, so back to, yeah, back to event. Little digression here. Um, it was always a challenge. I was working on Linux, I was producing numbers for them, and they liked that, but every so often, somebody, these people like to see charts and plots and graphs, and, and back in about 2003, Python's plotting situation wasn't terribly good. There was a package called Chaco that we used for one thing, and we'd, we'd, we'd have to produce all these plots once a quarter for the board book, and for reporting to the SEC and all that. Uh, and what would happen in between one quarter and an X, we'd upgrade the machine and Shaco would stop working. So I'm Googling one day, someone says, never mind Shaco, use Matplotlib, it's brilliant. I thought, well, I'll give it a whirl. By the way, the, this, is, this is, when you come to Bermuda, that's the pink sand that you get to enjoy. So I had a look at Matplotlib. Well, I had to produce a plot that looks like this, a stack par chart. Because basically, if you've used Excel, this is what Excel produces. And unfortunately, my charts have to look exactly like Excel, otherwise they weren't going to be happy. So I get Matplotlib. It doesn't do stack bar charts. But I'm I was working in Dublin at the time then. I get the train home at the night. I've downloaded the code, and it was brilliant. I could actually follow this code, and I found the bar chart code. A few lines of code changed. We had stack bar charts. Next morning on the way into the train, I tidied it up a bit, I got the patch ready, and I emailed it off to John Hunter, who was managing the project. 
And John Hunter was magnificent. I, I forgot about doing this. I'm busy working. Two o'clock in the afternoon, John Hunter arrives at work in Chicago. I get an email saying, thank you very much for this. That was wonderful. Uh, have you thought about doing this, this, and what? Well, long story short, he gave me about three weeks' work to do on the train. And, and when we added these tables down below, and he said, can you make a, an example for the gallery? And I, if you've used Matplotlib, the best thing about it, you go to the gallery, and you find the graph that looks like the one you want to do, and you click on it, and you find the code that makes it happen. So I did this example for him and sent it off, and, and I was pleasantly surprised when I came back to do this talk Somebody has, in the meanwhile, tidied it up, changed the colour palette. Now, I don't know how they were allowed to do that, because you have no idea the arguments we had at work about what colour these different things should be. So, moving on, like I said, event-driven development. So we're now in early 2004, and um, one of my colleagues, had, w there was this newfangled language, well, it was new to the reinsurers, called C Sharp. And, and everybody was like, you should be using C Sharp for everything. So he said, well, let's experiment on a system. Um, so he said, well, we never use the claim system because we're a reinsurer. And when, when you're doing reinsurance, nine years out of 10, you collect the premium and you don't pay out any money. The 10th year, you give all the money back, basically, because a disaster happens. So the least important system we had was the claim system. So this poor guy is, is teaching himself C Sharp. He's, trying to get his head around all the concepts. He's writing this claims system called Claims 2. And again, he should have run because it was a replacement for an existing system. Don't do that. What happens? 2004 was the year of the four hurricanes, as I know it. Um, there were four hurricanes, Charlie, Francis, Ivan and Jean, that hit Florida all in the same year. Suddenly, the claim system became the most important system in the company. And not only that, it grew a lot of new requirements because nobody had thought we might have two claims from the same company in the same year. And we didn't just get two, we got three and four. None of these hurricanes are actually Charlie, Francis, Ivan and Jean, but uh, actually this one in the bottom corner is kind of interesting. Anybody know what that might be? It's kind of, this is the Bahamas and this is the Azores. And, and this is actually Bermuda. And this was back in January of this year. Uh, a storm formed down in the Bahamas. It tracked north, went just north of Bermuda. We had a pretty stormy Friday night. I got up in the morning and the patio furniture was next door again and I went back and got it. It tracked across the Atlantic and in January it intensified and hit the Azores as a hurricane. So we're having hurricanes in January. You're not supposed to... It's not supposed to happen. The ocean was only uh, 72, it, it wasn't as warm. People say you have to be 26 degrees before you get a hurricane. It's not actually true. What matters is the difference in temperature between the ocean and the upper atmosphere, uh, and the, but together with the heat in the ocean. And, and the upper atmosphere was exceptionally cold at that time. On the, I like this picture here. This, was, this tree was knocked down by... Uh, Faye or Gonzalo, I'm not sure which. What they do in Bermuda is, after the trees have been knocked down in the storms, they, they come along with a crane and they pick them back up and then they tie them to the nearby trees to support them for a bit. This tree's now thriving. Fantastic stuff. So, moving forward to today. There's um, a project that's uh, been bubbling along for a few years now. Uh, to create an open loss model framework. Uh, all the models that I've been using up until this point, uh, proprietary loss models, they cost several million dollars to license. And um, they basically, you feed all your insurance policy data into them and they spit out uh, a loss curve for you. They, they have sort of maybe 10,000 or 50,000 hypothetical years of, of events. Um, and as I say, you feed your data in, you get your numbers out. The Oasis people have been trying to create a, an open framework which will allow... One, one of the problems that we're having with the, the commercial models is there's, there's lots of fantastic research uh, going on, new ideas, um, 
new insights, new data, it takes too long for these commercial companies to incorporate them in the models. So, so what they're trying to do with Oasis is create an open framework uh, where anybody can play. And also they want to separate the, the hazard model, which sort of tells you what, you know, like what the wind speed's going to be at each location for each of your hypothetical storms from the vulnerability model, which is, you know, given that there was a 70 mile an hour wind, how much damage was done to your house. And then separately on top of that, they given the damage, how much is the insurance claim going to be? Um, this young guy, this, this plot here was created by this young guy here, Beckett, a Bermudian guy who was working with Oasis. And they, tried to, they decided they needed a, an example to help people understand how the model works and build it. So uh, Peter Taylor, who was leading the project, um, he said, well, let's, let's do a toy windstorm model for a mythical town. We'll, we'll base it on Mel Melton Mowbray, but we won't call it Melton Mowbray. We'll call it pie because they make good pies in Melton Mowbray. So an, an interesting, this, this plot here again was created by Beckett with Matt Plotlib. So move on a few years. Uh, I think it was 2011, 2012. There were three earthquakes in quick succession or over a period of 18 months in Christchurch in New Zealand. They were a magnitude about six and a half, between six and a half and seven. Um, most of the catastrophe models that the, the, that the reinsurers are using make the assumption that earthquakes occur independently following uh, basically a sort of Poisson distribution. Um, so they, they weren't really expecting to get three earthquakes in the same place. And for, for most of the deals they write, they're one-year deals. You're on the hook for a year. So even though, as we know, you know, you do get these aftershocks and all the rest of it, uh, it's a reasonable approximation what they had. But, but most of these companies lost a lot of money by not modeling this um, as it should have been. They should have realized when the first quake came along in, in Christchurch, there's a reasonable chance of another big one and is an elevated chance and they should have adjusted the models, they didn't. Um, what else can, the other thing that was interesting in Christchurch was that uh, it turned out that the soil in Christchurch, uh, one of the things that happens when you get an earthquake is a thing called liquefaction. So if there's a lot of moisture in your, in your soil, when, when the earth starts to shake, it literally turns into a liquid. And this causes a lot of damage. Uh, obviously, you know, if the, the, the soil on which you built turns into a liquid, your building's going to collapse. So although it was only a 6.5 earthquake in Christchurch, it did a lot more damage than they were expecting because of the, the poor soil quality. Guess what? The models hadn't taken that into account. They were, they were simple models. They didn't really include information on the, on the soil. So, the message of this is that what, what we've been using for the past sort of 20 years are what I call black box models because the, 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 the companies that sell you them are very proud of their proprietary uh, secret source inside the boxes, which means um, you can't see inside for what they're actually doing. So it's a bit like the Schrodinger's cat experiment, only worse, that you've got your black box and you don't really know whether inside the cat's sleeping or it's turned into a dead bird. So you're making a wish, you put your data in, you make a wish and you hope it works. That's, that's the world on which, and, and, and there's billions of dollars being traded on the strength of these models. Now, I don't want to, I'm making them sound worse than they are. It turns out there's so much uncertainty in what's being done that, that really all you need from the model is a signal, something to detect the signal from the noise and be able to compare deals and is this a good one and uh, is this one better than that, you know, is the risk better and so on. And there's lots of other kind of soft issues that you have to take into account in that. If an, you know, some insurers uh, have a much stricter underwriting policy. Some of them are just desperate to, you know, their reps will, you ring them up and, and they'll find ways to keep your premium down to get your business. Again, back to the present day. Uh, this is... Uh, just north of Ottawa in Quebec. Uh, that picture on the right was taken in early January 2015. This was Christmas Day. It, it was plus 17 degrees in Quebec. 
It was plus 70 degrees in Quebec. You could have gone for a swim in the lake. Um, you know, things are changing on our planet. Um, it's time to invest in your solar powered clothes dryers. World's heating up. This again, we got Matt, Matt Plotlib to take, thank for this picture, and and also the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecasting. They have a fantastic data set of of what they call reanalysis data. They've got 40 years of what they for every day in the last 40 years, you can get a whole bunch of temp, uh, variables. Um, so you can get the maximum temperature, minimum temperature, the precipitation. Uh, the amount of evaporation from the planet and the photo radiation are just five of the variables and it's on a 0.75 degree grid. Um, I just like them because you can just, you just suck in the data and you just plot it with IMSHO on, on Matplotlib, they look beautiful. But, but this data set is, is, was created by running, new, for every day in that period they've run the numerical weather predict model, initialized with the, with the best guess of what the weather was like. You know, the, 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 uh, all the readings they had for that day. Uh, and it's, it allows us to create a baseline to compare the current day to. Very val valuable event set, and uh, if there's anybody here from the meteorology office, love to talk to you more about that data. Another big thing that's going on at the moment, cyber risk. Uh, Zurich Reinsurance just announced that um, Cybercrime was costing $445 billion a year. Now, they, they're interested in insuring you against cybercrime, so their estimate may be a little bit questionable, but it certainly costs money. My own view, uh, again, the word cyber actually in the, the field of cybernetics is actually about the feedback and control. It's nothing to do with computers directly. Uh, but I do feel that the way, world we're in at the moment with computers and information security, it's a bit like riding a tandem with nobody steering from the front. We, you know, we're, we're in a little bit of a crisis in that way, and it does concern me. Uh, I think it's, it should be a big concern to the insurance companies uh, with data leaking out left, right, and centre. Um, you know, it's, it's creating a lot of uncertainty in the world. Back to Oasis. So this is really the sort of world that we're living in, computer-wise. It's strung together with string. It's a little bit frightening. It just about works. With the, with the best open source tools out there, I think we can build something like that. Uh, it's not the best bridge in the world, but I'd rather cross the one on the right, and at least it leads to a nice oasis on the, on, on the far side. Um, we've also got some fantastic tools from the Python community and from free software in general, uh, pandas and, and I don't know whether you can see that slide, but actually that's Jupiter, the little white dot. The big red dot is actually a drone that was flying above my house. It was a little bit scary. The key thing here is these tools are fantastic at this point. There's the, the software problem, you know, there's a million solutions to every problem you have. There's magic at your fingertips, use it. These, these steps are in Bermuda, they're beautiful. There's, a, there's an organization called Shoestick and they do art about the town. And you just walk around the corner and you see something like this. I've got a little project to do with weather data and this is the only plug for my own stuff and it, I don't know whether it'll, most of my projects kind of start and then I find somebody else is already doing it better, but uh, I call it Karma Pie. This is Sooty, he's no longer with us I'm afraid, but uh, he was a great cat of mine. Uh, Karma Pie, the idea with it is distributed global uh, data. And, and to spread the load of serving that data because there's a lot of data out there. Again, I mentioned that weather data. What you find is you have to sign up and if you want to get access to most of the data, they have to cover the cost of the bandwidth and all the rest of it. It gets expensive and that gets inhibits people like myself and people like you who, who are wanting to analyze data. You have an idea, you think maybe I could use that weather data. Then you find you have to spend $3,000 to get it. So Karma Pi is, a, is an idea where I want to be able to host it on, on Raspberry Pis uh, and distribute the work. And, and the idea with it, I'm calling it Karma Pi because you play nicely, you get out of it what you put into it. I'd love to talk more about that. Sad note here, John Hunter, who, who created Matplotlib, was an absolutely fantastic guy. At, if you want a model for running an open source project, you couldn't 
hope for better. The encouragement he gave me was, was unbelievable. Peter Taylor uh, started the Oasis project, and the Oasis project is, is hopefully, they're planning on opening, open sourcing the code later this year. It's just coming to a critical point. Both these people are no longer with us. They both uh, became ill with cancer and, and, and passed. But I like to think, you know, we saw the talk this morning about the, the black holes. John Hunter's Matplotlib was used all over the place in the LIGO analysis. So those guys are creating ripples in space time and shaping our future. And, I, you know, I, I'm in, immensely grateful to the help that, that I've had over the years in my career. I like to think as well, we're all, we've all worked really hard to master some of these tools and we're all standing on top of our own little Everest. Uh, but I, I encourage you to look around and look at the hill over there. There might be some Ruby programmers over there that have got something useful or are programmers. Uh, or there's some more data and when you get on the top of a hill you can you can see where you're going a lot of the time we're struggling up the hill and we can't see the giant mountain behind um, but you know there's great tools out there there's, there's data everywhere there's wonderful opportunities and but we've got some difficult problems we've got a delicate planet that that needs a little bit of care and TLC Again, this is in the, in the ferry terminal in Bermuda and it's a little collage the school children made. Um, and underneath it, there's a quote from Mark Twain which says, throw off the bowline, sail away from the safe harbor, catch the trade winds in your sails and explore, dream and discover. And I, I invite everyone here to, you know, take these tools, take the data, probe around, see what you're gonna discover and, and, and be, you know, build on, we're, we're all working with the work of some great people here. So that's really all I've got to say now. Um, the sunshine's quite nice in Bermuda too, so do, I, do come and if we organize pay data there, which apparently is mostly down to me doing something, so I need to find some people to help me, um, do, come and, do come and visit. So that's all I've got to say for today. Then. Uh, we have uh, 12 minutes for questions. Excellent. No questions? Oh, one like yeah. So this, the weather data came from the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecasting. And if you go to their website, they have a, um, you have to, I think you have to sign up or something. They have a, quite a complex API and it takes you a, half a morning to figure out which data you want. Each variable, if, if you just squash it down to a floating point number, there's 14 gigabytes of data per variable um, so it, it can be a little bit uh, um, expensive you know downloading what you want and, and what have you and, and obviously you don't want to DOS the server if everybody goes and gets their data that, and that's part of the idea with with the Karma Pi idea is that these I, I want I want to I do a lot of work with schools and that in Bermuda and I want to make the data available to the school children so that they can see what's happening in the planet at large. But th this, this thing here has got, um, it's running Guido's clock on an eight by eight grid. It doesn't, it, it's great for when you want a clock that you can't tell the time with. Um, but it's also got a, a pressure sensor, a humidity sensor, an accelerometer, and um, What's that? It's got a compass and, and a couple of temperature sensors. So it's a mini weather station. Um, so this thing, you put a, an SD card with, with you know, 64 gigs of space on it, we could have most of the weather data available. What we can do is we could store that, if, if that's too much data to store on one, we can aggregate it up and have the baselines so that, and, and, and each of these pies, which only cost about $60, $70, with the sense act, uh, we can have little mini weather stations all over the place. And it's my belief that small islands like Bermuda, if they don't study their own climate and understand what climate change is going to mean for them, nobody else is going to do it for them. And, and I'm hoping that what we can do is uh, use local expertise. And there's a lot of local expertise about how to deal with hurricanes in Bermuda. When, when I, 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 these were the first two hurricanes I went through, Faye and Gonzalo. And, and it was fantastic. I, I was talking to locals and I got 
you know, 10 life-saving tips about how to go through a hurricane uh, from the local people who've been through it before. Uh, so I think if we can share the global data and the work, and we're already doing that by creating all this wonderful software, um, and then help different locations uh, you know, explain to each other and have conversations about what climate change is going to mean for us, because um, then, then we can maybe reach some consensus about how the world's going to deal with all that change. Any more? Uh I tell me about it. Yeah, I, 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 I. So I, I was very, very fortunate in the the. Com I'll, I'll mention the company I was at uh, from for, from about ninety seven till two thousand and nine, uh, was Renaissance Reinsurance, and I was very fortunate that that they kind of um, let me do my thing, and I was I was fortunate I was producing good stuff for them. Um, I'm currently consulting to another company, and it's a nightmare, to be quite honest. I, you know, the CIO said to me, why can't you use .NET and SQL Server? <laughs> and um, I didn't know it. And I, I asked, well, can we use, can you put your so software on? I, I can't even get them to get all the software into Team Foundation Server. Um, so it's, it, it's challenging. The, I, I think don't be confrontational, be patient. I think the big. I think what's actually going to happen is Microsoft are going to lead those companies to Linux. Uh, I don't know whether you know Windows 10 has Ubuntu embedded in it. In, in a, I'm not quite sure how it works. It's there's a bit of black magic in there, but I, I, you know Microsoft is is moving to Linux now, and well, it's not moving directly, but it's embracing that. It's making it easier to work with from there. Uh, trouble is at my company, they, they're on Windows 7. And it, it'll be another, uh, on the current pace, it'll be three or four years before they get to Windows 10. Um, it's, it's difficult, you know. Um, do you, have you got other friends who are, f find others that, that kindred spirits? Well, I think through, through our own of the pipe are mostly in the insurance industry, probably more than the pipe. Yeah. The, the other, I think so. I think the other big tip, uh, Anaconda Python's good because you can install it without admin privileges. Um, and, and, if you've, and if it's not in Anaconda, their, their distribution has pretty much everything you might need, so that helps. Um, but it's, 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 it's a challenge. We could talk some more about tips on that, but any more? Well, thank you very much. And